in the picturesque sunset cliffs of San Diego, on the afternoon of Friday, April 15, 1994, the tranquil scene took a haunting turn when two surfers stumbled upon a shocking discovery. Amidst the kelp bed, an anomaly caught to the attention of one surfer. Upon closer inspection, the surfer discerned the lifeless body of a young woman, marked by the absence of one leg from the thigh down and various injuries. Swiftly, authorities were alerted, and the autopsy findings attributed the demise of the 25-year-old woman, later identified as Michelle von Emster, to a great white shark attack. Nevertheless, skepticism lingered among shark experts who disputed this conclusion. Despite the official cause of death being classified as a shark attack, major inconsistencies in the evidence led to a prevailing belief that she had died at the hands of foul play. With some new revelations shedding light on the case, this mystery that has ignited fierce debate for the last 30 years may finally have found some real answers. Was Michelle's demise truly the outcome of a great white shark attack, or did the array of injuries hint at a darker, more tragic narrative? Let's find out together. Shark attack or murder? The mysterious death of Michelle von Emster. Born on August 2nd, 1968, Michelle von Emster spent her formative years in San Carlos, a city located just south of San Francisco in California, as one of five siblings. In 1986, she graduated from the all-girls Notre Dame High School, renowned for her keen interest in art, a profound love for the ocean, and characterized as beautiful and intelligent by her circle of friends, Michelle left a lasting impression. Post high school, Michelle pursued higher education at St. Mary's College. However, her academic journey took an unexpected turn when she had to withdraw due to a surprising cancer diagnosis shortly after her enrollment. Displaying remarkable resilience, she fought a formidable two-year battle and eventually achieved remission. With a renewed zest for life, Michelle embarked on a new chapter in San Diego. Initially residing on Poinsettia Drive in the Loma Portal neighborhood in 1992, she later relocated to Muir Avenue in Ocean Beach, an area colloquially known as the War Zone due to its elevated crime rate. While Michelle's neighborhood may raise concerns about safety, Ocean Beach holds a special place among locals for its diverse array of shops, restaurants, and attractions, including the iconic pier and tide pools. The community is a favorite among surfers seeking great waves, and visitors can even enroll in surf schools to learn the art of riding the waves. Despite this new less than ideal living environment, Michelle secured employment at a local coffee shop. But it wasn't long before she became concerned about an unidentified man on a motorcycle who she believed was stalking her at the coffee shop. This caused her to leave her job and find new employment at a stationery and office supply store. The identification of this alleged stalker remains unknown. Working as a clerk at Cabrillo Stationery and Office Supply, owned by Denise Knox on Newport Avenue, Michelle's life had aspects that eluded a clear definition. Some labeled her a party girl, while others viewed her as a health freak. The truth remains elusive, as her acquaintances, it would appear, really didn't know her well enough to make accurate assertions. Despite the mystery surrounding her personality, a few certainties about Michelle do exist. Her profound love for the ocean was evident. Additionally, she held an affection for felines and had a cat named Cassidy, later adopted by a considerate former neighbor. Sharing a residence on Muir Avenue with Michelle was Coco Campbell, a dance major at San Diego State University. On the evening of Thursday, April 14, 1994, Michelle and Coco planned to attend a Pink Floyd concert at a local stadium. However, upon arrival, their admission was thwarted, reportedly due to having the wrong tickets, at least according to some accounts. The duo left the stadium and headed home. But after 8 p.m., Michelle purportedly requested to be dropped off at a pier several blocks from their residence. Coco recounted that Michelle exited the vehicle on Newport Avenue, adorned in a green trench coat due to the icy cold weather, and carrying her purse. Tragically, this would be the last time anyone reported seeing Michelle alive. A gruesome discovery. On the afternoon of Friday, April 15, 1994, 20-year-old surfer David Correa observed an unusual gathering of seagulls near Sunset Cliffs, a popular spot among surfers and Point Loma residents. Perceiving the situation as peculiar, he alerted fellow surfer William Dostal, who was closer to the point of interest. Dostal paddled over to investigate and made a grim discovery. Michelle von Emster's lifeless body, face down in approximately 10 feet of water. Michelle was unclothed, adorned only with some jewelry. A lone wing of her butterfly tattoo remained visible, later serving as a means of identification for authorities after her boss, Denise Knox, saw it on a local news broadcast. Her right leg was missing from the thigh down. The men called for assistance, and lifeguards swiftly responded, transporting the body to the lifeguard headquarters on Kivira Court. Medical examiner Robert Engel conducted an initial examination, revealing large tearing-type wounds with missing tissue on Michelle's back and shoulders. Notably, her right leg was severed mid-thigh and was nowhere to be found. 
Engel estimated that she hadn't been in the water for an extended period when the surfers discovered her, potentially suggesting she had been placed there recently. The subsequent medical examiner's autopsy by Brian Blackburn delved into the extent of Michelle's injuries, painting a distressing picture. The report highlighted a broken neck, along with large, tearing-type wounds with missing tissue. The absence of her right leg from the thigh down was glaring, accompanied by shredded tissue on her arms and backside, cracked ribs, and a dislocated pelvis. Internal bleeding was ruled as the cause of Michelle's tragic end, leading to drowning. This revelation indicated that she was still alive when she entered the water. The presence of sand in her trachea, lungs, and stomach pointed to desperate attempts to breathe while submerged, whether in shallow water or at the ocean floor. The official verdict from the autopsy report deemed her death accidental, attributing it to a great white shark attack. Despite this classification, the unsettling details and dissenting opinions from experts continued to cast shadows of uncertainty on the circumstances surrounding Michelle's demise. And a major question lingered over the case like a bad smell. Why would Michelle be swimming in freezing water, completely naked, in the middle of the night? The alleged circumstance that led to her being attacked by the shark. Shadows of doubt. It's worth noting that Blackburn, the San Diego medical examiner handling the case, lacked prior experience with shark attack victims at the time of Michelle's autopsy. In fact, none of those who examined the body had ever encountered a shark attack victim before. Blackburn did seek guidance from experts at the nearby Scripps Institute of Oceanography to better understand shark attack victims. However, these experts never had the opportunity to personally examine the body. Notably, the International Shark Attack file refrains from categorizing Michelle as a shark attack fatality due to insufficient evidence. Contrary to the common belief, the ISAF contends that the shark bites found on Michelle's body were not attributable to great white sharks and, moreover, were inflicted post-mortem, indicating that she was already deceased when sharks interacted with her remains. Renowned shark expert Ralph Collier also expressed skepticism regarding the Great White Shark Attack hypothesis. In an interview with the San Diego Union Tribune, Collier remarked on the peculiar condition of Michelle's limb, stating, When a white shark bites off part of a limb, the break is clean, almost like you put it on a table saw. What remained of Michelle's femur was anything but. It looked like what happens when you get a piece of bamboo and whittle it down to a point with a knife. The bone came to a point. This type of injury is caused when a bone is twisted under a great deal of force. Collier also disputed the tooth impressions on Michelle's body, suggesting they were inconsistent with a white shark attack. Collier further challenged Blackburn's explanation about the severed leg and the presence of sand in Michelle's body, highlighting the incongruities in the case. According to Collier, the damage would have quickly led to fatal bleeding if caused by a shark, and the sand in her stomach suggests unusual breathing behavior upon contact with the sand. Retired pathologist Harry Bunnell echoed the skepticism, stating that he did not believe Michelle's death resulted from a shark attack either. When questioned about the possibility, Bunnell responded, It could have happened if she was at the bottom and couldn't get away. It's possible, but it's not probable. Richard Rosenblatt, chairman of the Scripps Institute for Oceanography, also contradicts Blackburn's findings. After reviewing the measurements of Michelle's wounds, Rosenblatt asserted that none of the marks on her body were indicative of a white shark's bite. He emphasized that if a white shark had taken her leg, evidence of a broken off great white tooth would likely be present. Despite the absence of great white teeth in Michelle's body, multiple bite marks from blue sharks were identified, confirming their feeding on her remains. A local pathologist found no evidence suggesting these bites occurred before her death. The conflicting opinions from experts contributed to the ongoing ambiguity surrounding the circumstances of Michelle von Emster's demise. Further mysteries. A purse, later confirmed to be owned by Michelle, was discovered approximately half a mile north of the location where her lifeless body was found. The contents of the purse included her driver's license, keys, cigarettes, and $27 in cash. Around 11 p.m. on Friday, April 15th, a passerby stumbled upon the purse, raising questions about its untouched state despite spending over 24 hours in plain sight on the beach. The discovery, occurring after Michelle's body had been located, sparked speculation about the possibility of the purse being strategically placed at the site following the discovery of her remains. A retired private investigator emphasized, it still had money inside it because it hadn't been on the beach that long, suggesting potential involvement from someone else who planted the purse. Notably, none of Michelle's clothes were ever located near the purse or anywhere else along the shoreline. In an attempt to comprehend the sequence of events, experts conducted drift tests to estimate the duration it would take for Michelle's body to drift from the purse's location to where surfers found her. 
The calculated time frame indicated approximately 15 hours for this drift to occur. Considering that Michelle was last seen around 8 p.m. the night before when her roommate dropped her off, there remains an unaccounted for four-hour period, nowhere near long enough for this drift to have occurred. No witnesses have come forward to attest to her whereabouts during this time. Although it is plausible that she spent some time on the beach before deciding to enter the water around midnight, the chilling water temperature of 59 degrees raises doubts about the feasibility of a midnight swim. The discomfort or potential risk of hypothermia during such conditions challenges the narrative of a leisurely skinny dipping activity. Edwin Decker, who had a recent date with Michelle before her disappearance, is also among those skeptical of the shark attack narrative. He expressed his doubt, stating, I was crazy about Michelle. I don't believe that's what killed her. Due to the abundance of conflicting evidence challenging the initial findings, the Michelle von Emster case underwent a re-examination in 2008. In this reassessment, medical examiner Glenn Wagner proposed an alternative conclusion. Sharks had scavenged Michelle's body post-mortem, given an expert had previously asserted that only a great white shark could have taken Michelle's leg, and all subsequent examinations have refuted this claim. Doubt has been cast on a great white shark attack, leading to the likely conclusion that this was not a shark attack at all. By following this line of reasoning and entertaining the notion that the young woman was indeed not a victim of a shark attack, an unsettling question emerges. What actually happened to Michelle von Emster? Other theories. The extensive injuries suffered by Michelle suggest a scenario beyond a mere shark attack, possibly involving a fall, accident, or foul play before her body ended up in the water. Midnight swim. According to this theory, Michelle engaged in a midnight swim, succumbing to the force of a riptide that violently propelled her against the rocks. The majority of her injuries were then sustained during this incident. Subsequently, blue sharks are believed to have fed on her lifeless body once submerged in the ocean. However, several factors cast doubt on this theory. First of all, the water temperature stood at 59 degrees, rendering a midnight swim unlikely due to the cold conditions. The night air at 57 degrees further diminishes the plausibility of anyone venturing for a midnight swim. Michelle's aversion to the cold is indicated by her attire at 8 p.m., where she was seen wearing a trench coat. The theory also fails to account for the missing leg and the manner in which it was removed from the body being inconsistent with shark activity. A fall from a cliff. Familiarity with Southern California, particularly the San Diego region, unveils the presence of sandy and precarious cliffs along the picturesque beaches. Given the history of injuries and fatalities from falls in this area, a theory proposes that Michelle may have tragically fallen from one of these cliffs. The sunset cliffs, standing at approximately 75 feet high, present a significant height where a fall could result in severe injuries, including a broken neck. This scenario posits that Michelle succumbed to her injuries and drowned before any potential shark involvement. While initially plausible upon closer examination, this theory also reveals some weaknesses. Although a fall could account for the broken neck and bruises, it is once again unlikely to explain the torn leg. The circumstances surrounding the missing leg present challenges to the notion of a straightforward cliff fall, especially if the tear was not done by a shark. Foul play. The main theory explored and favored by most investigators into the case is that of foul play. This theory posits that Michelle suffered at the hands of an assailant who either abandoned her to die in the Pacific or deliberately drowned her. A notable expert suggested that the extensive ingestion of sand, a result observed in her autopsy, would make sense if it had occurred at the shoreline during a struggle as someone drowned her. Regrettably, the murder hypothesis emerges as a compelling scenario for several reasons. First of all, Michelle resided in the precarious war zone neighborhood, notorious for its association with drugs and violence. The range of potential threats in such an environment opens the door to various grim possibilities that led to her body being disposed of at the cliffs. The inexplicable discovery of Michelle's naked body raises significant questions too. How could a victim of a shark attack, cliff fall, or accidental drowning end up unclothed? And if she had stripped off herself, why have her clothes never been found? Adding to the puzzle is the discovery of Michelle's purse in the sand. Approximately two and a half miles away from her body in a heavily trafficked area, the purse contained keys and money, making it improbable that it went unnoticed for 24 hours. This raises suspicion that someone might have orchestrated her murder and strategically placed the purse to obfuscate the crime as an accident. Some have theorized that Michelle might have suffered an overdose at a party, leading to the disposal of her body off the San Diego cliffs. Others speculate on the possibility of a boat collision during night surfing or a neck injury from body surfing. The diverse array of theories surrounding Michelle's death adds complexity to the mystery, leaving investigators and the public grappling with the unanswered questions surrounding this young woman's tragic fate. Expressing her own concerns, Michelle's mother shared, 
There's the ocean temperature and she was nude. Part of me does not want to dig this stuff up because it may create more hurt than help. But if there is foul play, I can't stand the thought of somebody walking around out there who could do it again. Suspects. Edwin Decker emerged as a person of interest in the investigation. In response to questioning, Decker made a peculiar claim, asserting that Michelle had a hippie vibe and enjoyed surfing in the nude. Contrary to this portrayal, none of Michelle's friends corroborated this description, and lifeguards at the scene could not recall witnessing Michelle ever engaging in nude surfing or swimming. The unusual assertion that Michelle enjoyed surfing naked raises eyebrows, particularly as it conveniently aligns with the circumstances of her body being found unclothed. Decker further disclosed that he and Michelle had spent time together and had engaged in weeks of flirtation. He asserted that he perceived a deep emotional and intellectual connection between them, adding a caveat, at least on my part. Upon learning of Michelle's demise, Decker penned a poem that included the lines, The report said there was a tattoo, a butterfly on her shoulder, which I remembered that night, on my couch when I, like the shark, chewed on her lips and took off her shirt. It's worth noting that Decker himself initiated the request for a re-evaluation of the case by the San Diego Medical Examiner's Office in 2008. The motive behind urging an official revisit, especially for someone potentially involved in foul play, remains uncertain. However, the oddity of the poem adds an intriguing layer to his connection to the case. It also remains uncertain whether Decker was the alleged stalker Michelle had mentioned. Decker himself acknowledged persistently pursuing Michelle for weeks until she reluctantly agreed to go on a date. But even the credibility of their supposed date is questionable. If Michelle considered him a stalker, the idea of spending any time alone with him, let alone an entire evening, seems improbable. It also seems peculiar that Decker became so deeply involved in investigating the circumstances of her death if he had only shared a single date with her. Going on the assumption Decker was not the stalker, this line of inquiry also raises several questions. Could this unknown figure have played a role in Michelle's demise? Michelle once employed at a local coffee shop, faced persistent stalking by an unknown man during her tenure. The relentless pursuit by this individual ultimately prompted Michelle to leave her job at the coffee shop. In an attempt to evade her persistent stalker, Michelle transitioned to a position at an office supply store. Denise Knox, Michelle's former boss, disclosed that shortly after Michelle's tragic demise, an unsettling man visited the store. This individual, characterized as strange, proceeded to make multiple copies of Michelle's autopsy report. Knox further noted that the man departed from the store on a motorcycle akin to the one Michelle had described. Continued questions. The uncertainty surrounding Michelle's whereabouts raises questions about the accuracy of her roommate Coco's statement regarding dropping her off at a dock. While her purse was found near the Ocean Beach Pier, it doesn't conclusively prove she was there. The possibility of someone dumping her purse remains. A discrepancy in the timeline emerges as Engel and Blackburn provide conflicting information on the time Michelle entered the water. Engel's immediate examination suggests a shorter duration, contradicting Blackbourne's midnight estimation. Engel's account is deemed more credible given the timely examination. Coco and Decker's roles appear suspicious too. Coco's vague details about dropping Michelle off at a pier near Newport Avenue and her failure to specify the exact location raised doubts. Questions also surround their alleged attempt to attend a concert with uncertainties about the venue and ticket issues and no proof that any of this ever actually occurred. Contrary to the shark attack theory, the circumstances of Michelle's injuries, including a severed leg, broken pelvis, and signs of violence, could potentially imply sexual assault, torture, or a violent encounter. However, it appears Blackbourne's rushed shark attack conclusion meant that none of these aspects were looked at during her official autopsy or properly examined, meaning clear answers may never truly be attainable, given it's now been over 30 years since her body was discovered. New Revelations in 2021, the Shark Files podcast shed light on the Michelle Von Emster case in an episode. About a year later, the podcast host revisited the case in a blog post, spurred by an article from 2019 authored by Michelle's sister, Teresa Colon, a mental health advocate. In a poignant narrative, Colon disclosed the harrowing abuse Michelle endured at the hands of serial pedophile priest Greg Ingalls. The article also delved into the subsequent cover-up orchestrated by the Catholic Church. Michelle's enduring struggles with addiction and health issues, and the profound impact on the family shared by Michelle and Teresa. Within the blog post, the podcast host noted that Cologne had seemingly edited a wiki article, leaving a comment that read, Updated details about my sister's death. No mystery on this one. A related Reddit post by the podcast host unveiled a comment from a user who remarked, The person who edited the page also added another line. After investigation, the family knows the true cause of death and has chosen to keep the details private. 
While the podcast host and Michelle's sister refrain from explicitly stating the cause of Michelle's death, the implications strongly suggest a connection to her childhood trauma. Whether her demise resulted from substance abuse, suicide, a blend of factors, or even the potential involvement of another individual, these revelations provide a nuanced perspective. However, it appears that the true answers might be held as a private family matter, leaving the full story shrouded in secrecy and mystery. And with that, our video has reached its end. As always, thanks so much for watching, and if you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe as it really helps the channel to grow. What do you think truly happened to Michelle? Do you think the simple shark attack narrative holds up? Perhaps you lean towards an accidental death theory. Personally, without clear answers of what the family know, I gravitate towards foul play given the evidence and inconsistencies in all the other explanations. Let me know your thoughts on this one down in the comments section below. You have been watching The Mystery Abyss. In the summer of 1980, Dorothy Jane Scott, a 32-year-old single mother living in Stanton, Southern California, experienced a tragic end to what started as a simple act of kindness for a work colleague. On the fateful evening of May 28, 1980, after attending an employee's meeting, Dorothy noticed a peculiar bite on her co-worker Conrad Bostrin's arm. Out of concern, she volunteered to drive him to the UC Irvine Medical Center with another colleague, Pam Head accompanying them. Upon reaching the emergency room, they discovered that Conrad had been bitten by a black widow spider. After receiving the necessary prescription and treatment, Conrad was discharged around 11 p.m. Given Conrad's woozy state, the plan was for Dorothy to walk to her car and drive it to the ER exit, while Pam waited with Conrad to fill his prescription at the medical center pharmacy. As the pair waited patiently, Dorothy seemed to be taking an abnormally long time to return to them. After several more uneasy minutes, the duo decided to venture out into the parking lot and see what was causing the holdup. Suddenly, Dorothy's car sped towards them, its headlights beaming in the night and blinding their view of the driver. They tried frantically to get Dorothy's attention, but the car swiftly passed by them before sharply turning right and exiting the parking lot. While this all seemed odd, the pair assumed some sort of emergency, perhaps involving her son, had necessitated her to rush off without telling them. But over the next few hours, unable to reach her and uncover her whereabouts, their concern grew and they felt they had no choice but to report Dorothy as missing to the police. The following morning, Dorothy's burnt out and abandoned car was discovered in an alleyway, approximately 10 miles from the hospital. Law enforcement began working on the theory that Dorothy had been kidnapped, initiating an investigation into the perplexing circumstances surrounding her disappearance. You see, leading up to her disappearance, Dorothy had been grappling with unsettling anonymous phone calls from a man who appeared to be stalking her. The caller had issued chilling threats, vowing to harm her when alone, stating he would cut her up into bits so no one will ever find her. Sadly, however, Dorothy's body would eventually be found. But despite the passage of four decades, the mystery surrounding her abduction and murder remains unsolved to this day. The Mysterious Murder of Dorothy Jane Scott Residing in Stanton, California, Dorothy Jane Scott was a single mother dedicated to raising her four-year-old son, Sean, who she lived with alongside her aunt. Sean's father, a man called Dennis Terry, resided in Fairgrove, Missouri, and Dorothy was fairly secretive about the details of their previous relationship. Dorothy worked as a secretary for two jointly owned stores in Anaheim, California. Swinger's Psych Shop, specializing in psychedelic items like lava lamps and love beads, and Custom John's Head Shop. The shops were previously owned by Dorothy's father, Jacob, before he sold them to John Kikola. Despite no longer owning the businesses, Jacob frequently did odd jobs for the stores and was well known by all the employees. According to her family and colleagues, Dorothy was deeply religious and cherished spending time at home with family. She steered clear of alcohol and never engaged in drug use. Her parents, Jacob and Vera Scott, who also resided in Anaheim, played an active role in their grandson's life, often providing babysitting services while Dorothy was at work. Known for her kindness, generosity, and strong religious convictions, Dorothy left a lasting impression on all who knew her. On the evening of May 28, 1980, Dorothy participated in a work employee meeting where she observed her co-worker, Conrad Bostrin, appearing unwell with a red mark on his arm. Concerned for his well-being, Dorothy, accompanied by another co-worker, Pam Head, promptly left the meeting and drove Conrad to the emergency room at UC Irvine Medical Center. 
En route to the hospital, Dorothy made a brief stop at her parents' home to check on her son and exchanged her black scarf for a red one. At the hospital, medical professionals diagnosed Conrad's condition as a black widow spider bite and swiftly treated his injury. Throughout Conrad's stay in the emergency room, Dorothy and Pam remained in the waiting area until his discharge at 11 p.m. Given a prescription for medication, Conrad still felt unwell, prompting Dorothy to offer to bring her car around for him. Prior to leaving, she briefly used the restroom, but as Pam and Conrad waited at the exit, they noticed Dorothy had not returned after a few minutes. So they decided to walk back to the original parking spot of the car, but as they approached, Dorothy's car sped towards them, its high beams hindering their view of the driver. Attempting to grab her attention, they waved their arms, but the white Toyota station wagon didn't stop or slow down, but instead merged onto the road and drove away. Pam and Conrad initially waited, speculating that an emergency involving her son might have arisen. Growing increasingly worried when Dorothy failed to return, Conrad and Pam chose to contact Dorothy's parents. As they were well acquainted with Dorothy's father, Jacob, due to his ongoing role at the stores, they knew his phone number by heart. However, her parents also hadn't heard from their daughter, prompting the official report of Dorothy's disappearance. When police arrived at the scene, they found no evidence alarming enough to consider the possibility of foul play. However, Pam was certain something was wrong. Why would Dorothy willingly wait all that time in the emergency room, offer to bring her car around for them to be helpful, and then just drive off with no warning? Even if there had been an emergency, surely she could have spared five more minutes to tell them she had to leave. The following day, law enforcement responded to a location approximately 16 kilometers from the hospital where Dorothy went missing, prompted by reports of a car engulfed in flames. At 4.30 a.m., officers discovered her white 1973 Toyota station wagon abandoned and burning in an alleyway. But Dorothy was conspicuously absent. It appeared as though the vehicle had been abandoned in a hurry. The headlights remained on, and the driver's side door was left ajar. Examination of the trunk revealed a gas canister indicating the use of an accelerant on the passenger side of the car. While the outer front of the vehicle remained relatively intact, the interior had been completely destroyed. Subsequent inquiries with her parents revealed a troubling revelation. In the months leading up to her disappearance, Dorothy had been receiving anonymous calls at work from an unidentified man, indicating a potential stalker. Although she had felt like she recognized the man's voice, she was unable to recall who it belonged to or where she knew it from. Disturbing phone calls. The unknown caller oscillated between professing love and issuing threats of violence, demonstrating an unsettling knowledge of Dorothy's daily routine. The caller consistently asserted that he was surveilling her every move, delving into the intricacies of Dorothy's daily life, recounting details ranging from her activities and conversations to her outings with her son. Vera, Dorothy's mother, recounted a particularly chilling incident when the man instructed Dorothy to go outside, where she discovered a single dead red rose on her car's windshield. Another call left Dorothy horrified as the man menacingly declared, Okay, now you are going to come my way, and when I get you alone, I will cut you up into bits so no one will ever find you. Following this alarming call, Dorothy contemplated the idea of obtaining a firearm for self-protection. However, she ultimately chose to enroll in karate classes as a means of self-defense. While speculation suggested relationship issues as a potential motive, Dorothy's father, Jacob, refuted this, stating that although she had occasionally dated, she did not currently have a boyfriend. Slightly more than a week after Dorothy's mysterious disappearance, her mother was rattled by a phone call from an unidentified man who chillingly stated, Are you related to Dorothy Scott? Well, I've got her, before abruptly hanging up. From 1980 to 1984, these unsettling calls persisted without pause, occurring almost every Wednesday afternoon. The anonymous caller would claim to have Dorothy, or assert that he had taken her life. These calls were consistently brief, and always transpired when Vera Scott, Dorothy's mother, was alone at home. The question lingered, was this caller the same individual responsible for Dorothy's demise, the one who had tormented her over the phone for months? Police directives urged her parents to withhold information from the press to safeguard the case, but eventually, with no progress in the search for Dorothy after several weeks, Vera and Jacob Scott decided to share their daughter's story with the local newspaper, Orange County Register. Additionally, they offered a $25,000 reward in the hope of obtaining any information that could lead to a breakthrough in their daughter's case. The Newspaper Article On June 12, 1980, the article detailing Dorothy's disappearance was published. 
That same day, an unidentified man contacted the front desk and spoke with managing editor Pat Riley, admitting to the kidnapping and murder of Dorothy Scott. He asserted, I killed her. I killed Dorothy Scott. She was my love. I caught her cheating with another man. She denied having someone else. I killed her. The caller demonstrated knowledge of undisclosed details such as Conrad Bostron's spider bite on the evening of May 28th, and Dorothy's change from a red scarf to a black one after the employee meeting. Furthermore, the caller alleged that Dorothy had contacted him from the hospital. However, this particular detail contradicts Pam's account, who insisted she was with Dorothy the entire night at the hospital and denied any phone call being made. Unless Dorothy made a call between using the restroom and retrieving the car, the alleged call did not occur in reality, but rather in the abductor's distorted perception. Either that or some details about what happened that night in Pam and Conrad's accounts would have to be entirely wrong. It's essential to note that this was 1980, devoid of cell phones or pagers. Any call Dorothy could have made would likely have been from one landline to another, most likely a home phone. The feasibility of the stalker making it to the hospital from the supposed call location in such a short time frame is doubtful. Investigating the patrons of the head shop where Dorothy was employed yielded little progress. Her role in the office kept her somewhat removed from the eccentric clientele at Swingers. The primary lead in the case remained the mysterious caller, but despite the police's efforts to trace these calls, they were consistently terminated before the source could be identified. These disconcerting calls persisted for four years, casting a long shadow over Dorothy's parents. However, in April 1984, a significant development occurred. When Jacob, Dorothy's father, answered the phone, the caller promptly hung up and refrained from calling back for four months. This peculiar behavior raised the question, was the caller apprehensive that Dorothy's father might recognize his voice? Dorothy's father was also entwined with both business she worked at. So had the stalker been another employee of one of these businesses, it's plausible to imagine that Jacob may have been able to identify their voice. Is this the reason they hung up and then refrained from calling back after he answered, perhaps? Despite the relentless harassment, the family chose not to change their number holding on to the hope that Dorothy's abductor might allow her to communicate with them. Given the impromptu nature of Dorothy heading to the hospital that night, her assailant, it would appear, possessed knowledge of her whereabouts, even being aware that she had made a stop at her parents' place and changed her scarf. It thus has to be assumed that this figure was watching her every move and was waiting in the darkened hospital parking lot where they seized the opportunity when Dorothy returned to her car alone. The attack may not have been part of a preconceived plan, Rather, it may have been an opportunistic strike, suggesting that the assailant had been tailing her. Regardless of what truly transpired that fateful night, in August that year, the unthinkable was finally confirmed. A gruesome discovery. On August 6, 1984, an adult human skeleton, partially charred, was found approximately half a mile east of Eucalyptus Drive in northeast Anaheim, California. Jesse Loza, foreman at Mako Construction Company, made the unexpected discovery around 7.15 a.m., while preparing his crew for laying pipe for Pac Bell telephone lines. The find occurred just moments after Loza jokingly told his crew to watch out for dead bodies. Adjacent to the adult skeleton lay the partial remains of a dog. Richard Rodriguez, Orange County Deputy Coroner, initially speculated that the individual and the dog might have been on a hiking excursion when an unforeseen event occurred. The scattered nature of the remains over a 25-foot radius suggested animal activity and the bones had a burned appearance due to a brush fire that swept through the area in the fall of 1982. As a result, Rodriguez estimated that the bones had been at the site for over two years. Investigators gathered a complete skull, two femurs, a pelvis, an arm, and dog bones. The location was surrounded by housing tracks, overlooking the Riverside Freeway, situated about 30 feet from Santa Ana Canyon Road. Exposed to the sun, the bones had taken on a sun-bleached hue, yet the skull remained fully intact showcasing a set of teeth adorned with numerous fillings. Rodriguez indicated that an attempt would be made to cross-reference the dental records with the missing person's database in the hope of establishing the body's identity. Forensic examination soon revealed a watch and a turquoise ring among the remains, both identified by Vera Scott as belonging to her daughter. The watch had ceased functioning at 12.30 a.m., slightly more than an hour after the last sighting of Dorothy's vehicle by Pam and Conrad on May 28, 1980. A few days later, on August 14th, the bones were officially identified through dental records as belonging to Dorothy Jane Scott. Given that only skeletal remains were left, the pathologist was unable to ascertain the cause of death. While this discovery brought some closure to her family, the mystery surrounding her death remained unsolved. 
With Dorothy's identity confirmed, the presence of the dog bones could no longer be easily explained, adding a bizarre additional puzzle piece to this compelling mystery. Some have since theorized a potential occult connection, adding weight to suspicions against a local resident named Mike Butler. Living in the nearby hills and adhering to alternate religious beliefs, Butler, a mechanic, was not a prime focus for the police, but amateur investigators have since speculated on his involvement. Creepy calls continue. Shortly after the recovery of Dorothy's remains, the unsettling mystery calls resumed after three months of silence. The caller, once again inquiring about Dorothy's presence, added another layer of distress to the grieving family. In an attempt to trace the caller, the police installed a voice recorder at the Scott home. However, the caller's brevity on the line made it impossible to identify the number. Mrs. Scott expressed the agonizing toll of the years of torment, stating, For four years the caller has tortured us. He took a life that loved life. I feel in my heart that he deserves some sort of punishment. The family believes the individual that was calling them is the same person who had harassed their daughter for months before her disappearance. However, no one has ever been charged with her murder, leaving the eerie case unsolved. A memorial service on August 22, 1984 finally allowed Dorothy's parents to lay their daughter to rest. Jacob Scott passed away in 1994 on the birthday of Dorothy and Vera Scott later passed away in 2002. The taunting and cruel phone calls that this killer redirected to Dorothy's grieving parents inflicted additional pain. Dorothy's son, Sean, grew up without knowledge of what transpired or why his mother was taken from him. The unknown stalker who had terrorized Dorothy before the abduction and murder remains at large, an individual who has yet to face justice for extinguishing an innocent life, leaving behind enduring grief and a lifetime of unanswered questions. The Potential Culprits Law enforcement swiftly interrogated Sean's father in connection to Dorothy's vanishing. Given they had had a recent disagreement regarding Sean's custody, there was speculation that Dennis Terry's emotions and desire for custody might have motivated him to remove Dorothy from the picture. Notably, the absence of audible signs of distress during Dorothy's alleged abduction raises the possibility that she might have been acquainted with her abductor. Despite these considerations, no concrete evidence implicated Dennis in her disappearance. He asserted that he was on a two-day bus journey back to Missouri when the incident occurred, supported by receipts and eyewitnesses. Additionally, reports indicated that he had phoned Dorothy's parents' residence from his Missouri home on the day of the kidnapping. Dorothy's father even conversed with him over the phone later that day to convey news of the abduction. These factors diminished the likelihood of his involvement in the events surrounding Dorothy's disappearance. Reportedly, Dorothy's son, Sean, became aware of a suspect named Mike Butler through several of Dorothy's friends residing in Missouri. Butler's sister worked with Dorothy at Swinger's Psych Shop, and Butler himself had worked at an auto body shop conveniently located across the street, shedding light on how he could have been acquainted with Dorothy's schedule. Interestingly, during police questioning after Dorothy's disappearance, Butler revealed an infatuation with her, expressing a desire to marry her. This revelation, given the circumstances, raised eyebrows. Rumors circulated about Butler's instability and alleged involvement in occult activities, potentially shedding light on the peculiar discovery of a dog skeleton with Dorothy's remains, which some have speculated as having ritualistic connection. Sean has attempted to initiate conversations with Butler's sister on multiple occasions, but she reportedly has been unwilling to engage with him. How good a suspect Mike Butler really is has been heavily disputed by those who actually knew him, however and he has since passed away, taking any potential answers with him to the grave. The accounts of Pam and Conrad have come under scrutiny over the years, with some even speculating that they may have been somehow involved in her kidnapping and murder. But as with everything in this case, these ideas are nothing but speculation, with no real evidence to back them up. It does, however, seem likely that somebody linked to Dorothy's places of work was involved. Given her narrow social life, it would not only explain why she felt she recognized the voice of her stalker, but why they refused to talk when her father answered, and even provides an explanation for how they knew so much about her life and, and details about the night she vanished. Intriguingly, John Kaikola, the owner of the stores where Dorothy served as a bookkeeper, reportedly held ownership of the land where Dorothy's remains were discovered. If John was indeed responsible for her demise and believed that nature or wildlife would obscure any evidence, he likely miscalculated the gradual descent of the remains down the hill toward the road. John would also have been privy to Dorothy's plans that fateful night. In 1996, years after Dorothy's tragic death, John faced federal charges related to tax evasion. It could be speculated that Dorothy, working on the books, stumbled upon irregularities, prompting John to eliminate her. 
If this was what actually happened, is it possible that John initiated a campaign of phone calls in order to create the illusion of a passionate stalker and force investigators to look in the wrong direction? This elaborate ruse could explain the persistent calls post-disappearance, ceasing abruptly when Dorothy's father, Jacob, answered, as he would obviously recognize John's voice. Sadly, none of these theories are anything more than speculation, and the disappearance and tragic fate of Dorothy Jane Scott remains shrouded in mystery leaving a trail of unanswered questions that continue to haunt those touched by her story. As the case remains officially unsolved, the enduring pain for Dorothy's loved ones is palpable. The unresolved questions, the persistent torment inflicted by the mysterious caller, and the void left by Dorothy's absence, underline the need for continued attention to this perplexing case. Hope persists that one day the truth will surface and provide closure to a haunting chapter in the annals of unresolved mysteries. Until then, Dorothy Jane Scott's memory lives on, a testament to the enduring impact of a life cut short, and the relentless pursuit of justice. As always, thanks so much for watching. If you found this video interesting, please like and subscribe and drop a comment down below about this strange case. If you have any more information or theories about this one, please let me know as I'd be really interested to hear them. You have been watching The Mystery Abyss. The afternoon of August 20th, 1966, started like any other for a young boy flying his kite on the serene Vintem Hill, just outside of Rio de Janeiro. As the boy's kite soared against the backdrop of the vast Brazilian sky, his gaze was suddenly drawn to something that sent shivers down his spine. Nestled amidst the rugged terrain lay the lifeless bodies of two men, Manuel Pereira de Cruz and Miguel José Viana. What should have been a peaceful hillside had transformed into a haunting tableau of death and mystery. The scene was eerie, even surreal, as the bodies of De Cruz and Viana lay motionless, wearing matching suits with their eyes hidden beneath masks made of lead. The metallic masks, an unusual and unsettling sight, gave the entire situation an aura of foreboding, casting a pall of mystery over the landscape. In the annals of the unsolved, the lead masks case stands out as one of the most bizarre mysteries of all time, filled with potential links to psychedelic experiments, strange spiritualist groups of electricians, and even alien contact. Contacting Mars, cults of electricians, and mysterious masks, the puzzle of the lead masks case. As investigators delved into the strange deaths, intrigue did not end with the unusual lead masks. As authorities began to piece together the fragments of this macabre puzzle, they discovered a notebook lying near the bodies. This unassuming notebook was filled with cryptic instructions, adding another layer of mystery to an already bewildering case. The mundane act of flipping through its pages revealed words that raised more questions than answers, hinting at a hidden purpose or intent that investigators couldn't comprehend. The masks and the notebook were like little pieces of a puzzle, but a puzzle that didn't fit together. Each component seemed to deepen the layers of intrigue surrounding the case, but provide none of the needed answers. What sinister or inexplicable sequence of events had led the two suited men to this desolate hilltop? And who or what was responsible for their tragic deaths? The victims. Manuel Pereira de Cruz and Miguel José Viana were not ordinary men leading ordinary lives. Hailing from a vibrant city nestled within the heart of the Brazilian capital state, these two electronic technicians were united by more than just their shared profession. De Cruz and Viana were bound by an insatiable curiosity, a thirst for understanding the mysterious and the unexplained that propelled them into a world of uncharted territories. Their lives were a testament to the allure of the unknown, as they explored subjects that stirred both fascination and trepidation in equal measure. UFOs, extraterrestrial life, and the cosmos were not just idle topics for them. They were fields of exploration, realms of possibility that they sought to unravel with scientific rigor and an open mind. Yet, it was not just the cosmos that captured their attention. The duo's interests extended into the realms of spiritualism, where the ethereal and the corporeal intertwined, inviting them to explore the boundaries of existence itself. Their pursuits were marked by a willingness to confront the unknown, to question the boundaries of reality, and to challenge the very fabric of conventional understanding. It was this insatiable curiosity that would eventually lead them to Vintem Hill, a place that would forever become synonymous with their names. As they ascended the hill, De Cruz and Viana carried with them not only their hopes and aspirations, but also the weight of their questions, their notebooks, and the mysterious lead masks they would ultimately be found wearing. 
In death as in life, their story has become a juxtaposition of the ordinary and the extraordinary, a tale of two individuals whose pursuit of the unexplained ultimately ended in an unexplained mystery of their own, the masks. Within the realm of unsolved mysteries, few possess the captivating visual intrigue as the lead masks in this case. These curious artifacts, fashioned from a single piece of lead, concealed the countenances of Manuel Pereira da Cruz and Miguel Jose Viana, shrouding them in mystery even in death. The lead masks were a tangible embodiment of the bizarre riddle that encompassed their lives and final moments, inviting speculation, wonder, and raising endless unanswerable questions. What could have driven them to fashion these eerie visages before ascending the hill? The answer, like the masks themselves, has remained hidden from us, igniting the imagination of investigators and armchair detectives alike. One hypothesis suggests that the lead masks served as a protective barrier against an unidentified external threat of some kind. Could the wearers have been shielding themselves from the perils of radiation, toxic gases, or some other hazard that they anticipated encountering? If so, what compelled them to fashion these makeshift defenses? Alternatively, could the masks have been a part of a ritualistic practice aimed at inducing a transcendent experience or opening a gateway to realms beyond ordinary perception? The notion of de Cruz and Viana seeking a spiritual or metaphysical encounter adds an ethereal layer to the already perplexing puzzle. These strange objects, both haunting and alluring, have come to symbolize the heart of the case, a paradoxical blend of the tangible and the inexplicable. As we gaze upon the cold, unyielding metal that once masked the faces of the victims, we are left to grapple with an endless range of possibilities, each one unlocking a new aspect of a mystery that continues to defy resolution. The strange instructions. Amidst the stark tableau of death on Vintum Hill, a notebook lay nestled close to the lifeless bodies of Manuel Pereira de Cruz and Miguel Jose Viana. Handwritten notes within its pages whispered of a cryptic rendezvous with destiny. The inked words, shrouded in intrigue, beckoned to be deciphered, offering hints that only deepened the enigma of the lead masks case. 1630 be at the determined location, 1830 ingest capsules, after effect, protect metals mask. A sequence of instructions that defies easy interpretation. Within this brief, mysterious passage lay the potential keys to understanding the final hours of de Cruz and Viana. Were these unusual directives a roadmap to an otherworldly encounter? Or did they offer insight into a clandestine experiment? A quest to unravel the mysteries of the cosmos? Or perhaps the human mind? The journey that these two intrepid electronic technicians embarked upon appeared to be guided by a meticulous plan, with specific times and actions prescribed. The notation of a determined location hints at a premeditated purpose known only to them. As the clock struck 1630, did de Cruz and Viana find themselves standing at the precipice of revelation, prepared to unlock secrets beyond mortal comprehension? The reference to ingesting capsules raises a curtain of ambiguity. What were the contents of these capsules, and how were they intended to alter the perception or state of the individuals who consumed them? Were the capsules a catalyst for a metaphysical voyage or an experiment in consciousness alteration? And then the after effect. A directive to protect Metal's mask. Did the mask serve as a shield against the aftermath of the capsule's effects, protecting the wearers from a potent force unleashed by their actions? Or was the Metal Mask itself a conduit, a vessel designed to capture and channel the ethereal currents sparked by the ingested capsules? The notebook's cryptic instructions thrust us into a realm of conjecture and wonder. Were these notes the keys to an arcane ritual, woven from threads of curiosity, spirituality, and scientific inquiry? The investigation. The investigation into the Lead Mask's case has been a journey through the unknown, where every step forward seems to be met with yet another layer of intrigue. With each passing year, the mystery of Manuel Pereira de Cruz and Miguel Jose Viana's deaths becomes more shrouded in shadows, challenging investigators and amateur sleuths alike to untangle the web of questions that has lingered for decades. From the very outset, the investigation was confronted by a daunting landscape of challenges. The lead masks that concealed the faces of the victims added an eerie aura to the scene, hinting at an intention that remains frustratingly hidden from us. Authorities grappled with the absence of definitive evidence, leaving room for speculation to creep into the void. The notebook, with its cryptic instructions, was a tantalizing piece of the puzzle. Yet its meaning has remained hidden to this day. Authorities embarked on a wide-spanning investigation, navigating the delicate balance between uncovering the truth and confronting the insane mysteries that seemed to envelop the case. The possibility of foul play was looked into as investigators tried to figure whether the deaths were the result of a sinister plot or a tragic accident. Yet, like phantoms in the night, definitive conclusions remained elusive. 
allowing the lead mask case to linger in the realm of uncertainty. The backgrounds and interests of De Cruz and Viana added new dimensions to the puzzle. Their scientific pursuits and curiosity about the unexplained offered a strange glimpse into the minds of two individuals who may have been straddling the boundaries between the known and the unknowable. The circumstances of their deaths, coupled with their fascination with topics like UFOs and extraterrestrial life, have left many investigators and theorists to link what happened to something extraordinary, something that defies conventional explanation. No evident injuries came to light at the initial scene of the investigation, and this trend continued during the subsequent autopsy that occurred several weeks later. The coroner's office was grappling with a heavy workload during this period, leading to a significant delay before the autopsy could be carried out. Unfortunately, the internal organs of the deceased had undergone substantial decomposition by the time the autopsy was conducted, rendering comprehensive testing unreliable. Regrettably, the prolonged delay precluded any opportunity to conduct tests for potentially toxic substances. This has meant there is no way to know what the pair ingested if they were on any sort of substance or if something poisonous or toxic had affected them. Interestingly, about two months before the fatalities, an explosion had occurred in Manuel's garden involving the duo and their friend Elcio Gomes. Stranger still, another electronics technician had tragically perished atop a different hill four years prior, wearing a lead mask strikingly similar to the ones found in the lead mask's case. Regrettably, the specifics of the earlier death are hard to come by or corroborate. Nonetheless, the existence of these linked incidents within the local electrical repair community raised intriguing questions. What exactly was happening here? Further inquiries brought to light a compelling connection between the victims and a larger spiritualist group. Elcio Gomez, upon being interviewed by the authorities, divulged that the trio were members of a local collective known as Scientific Spiritualists. Their shared objective was an ambitious attempt to establish contact with Mars, and the explosion was attributed to a device constructed in pursuit of this goal. Could this Martian contact have something to do with their deaths? A discovery within Miguel's home workshop added another layer to the mystery. A book containing highlighted passages referencing intense luminosity linked to spirits. Such references led to the hypothesis that the lead masks may have served as a safeguard against anticipated intense luminosity, potentially signifying a protective measure for the eyes. A statement published two weeks following the deaths in a local newspaper attributed to a self-proclaimed professor of yoga hinted at a different perspective. According to this individual, the local spiritualist community was known to dabble in psychedelic substances and he conjectured that Manuel and Miguel had succumbed to an accidental overdose. While this account rested on anecdotal evidence, it intriguingly aligned with the limited information available and provided an alternative angle to consider. In the absence of definitive answers, and with no way to test what substances were in their bodies, speculation has flourished like wildflowers in the fertile soil of mystery. The Lead Masks case has become a canvas upon which a multitude of interpretations has been painted. The mystery has transcended the boundaries of a conventional investigation, becoming a tapestry woven from threads of curiosity and speculation. The veil of uncertainty that cloaks De Cruz and Viana's deaths is a reminder that even in the modern age of forensic science and technological advancement, there are mysteries that continue to elude our grasp. As the years march on, the case stands as a testament to the enduring power of the unknown inviting us to peer into its depths and contemplate the secrets that remain hidden within its folds. The Labyrinth of Theories As the sun dipped below the horizon on that fateful day in 1966, it cast long shadows over the rocky terrain of Vintum Hill, where the lifeless bodies of Manuel Pereira da Cruz and Miguel José Viana lay enshrouded in mystery. In the years that followed, a tapestry of theories would be woven, each thread attempting to illuminate the shadowy corners of the lead mask's case. These theories, like constellations in the night sky, beckon us to navigate through the cosmic questions that surround this baffling incident. The experiment. Among the whispered theories that echo through the corridors of speculation is the notion that De Cruz and Viana were part of a clandestine scientific experiment, a journey into the depths of altered consciousness. Could the ingestion of capsules referenced in the notebook have been the first step into uncharted realms of the mind? Could these two intrepid souls have been willing pioneers in an audacious attempt to breach the boundaries of human perception? If so, the masks may have been not only protection but also instruments, guiding them through uncharted psychological territories, spiraling into the spiritual. The veil between the material and the metaphysical has long fascinated humanity, and some theories posit that De Cruz and Viana were explorers on a spiritual quest, where they engaged in practices that sought to transcend the limitations of the physical realm. Embarking on a journey of spiritual enlightenment, the metallic masks in this context may have been symbolic tokens of their reverence for higher realms or protective talismans as they navigated the intricate pathways of the spirit. Echoes from the extraterrestrial? 
Amidst the plethora of theories, one stands out like a beacon in the night. The possibility of a cosmic connection to extraterrestrial forces. Could De Cruz and Viana have been seekers of the unknown, attempting to establish contact with beings from beyond our world? The masks, often seen as potential shields, might have been forged not against earthly elements, but as safeguards against an otherworldly encounter. The pages of the notebook with its cryptic instructions could hold the keys to a communication protocol or a ritual designed to bridge the gap between the terrestrial and the extraterrestrial. And if this was the case, what exactly led to their deaths? In pursuit of cosmic revelation, in their fascination with UFOs and the mysteries of the cosmos, De Cruz and Viana may have been driven by a desire to uncover the secrets of the universe. The tantalizing theory suggests that they sought to decode the language of the stars, to commune with cosmic entities that reside beyond our comprehension. The masks, then, could have been the protective veils behind which they ventured into the cosmic abyss, opening themselves to encounters of a celestial nature. As we traverse the labyrinthine corridors of speculation, we find ourselves standing at the crossroads of myriad possibilities. The lead mask's case is a mosaic of intrigue, offering fragments of truth entwined with threads of the unknown. With each theory, a glimpse into the minds of these two enigmatic figures emerges, a testament to the unquenchable human thirst for understanding, discovery, and the mysteries that beckon from the edges of reality. While the case remains unsolved, its legacy endures as a timeless mystery, inviting us to cast our gaze towards the heavens and ponder the profound mysteries that lie beyond the lead masks, beyond the cryptic notes, and beyond the veil of the unknown. Conclusion the Lead Mask's case remains a strange and haunting puzzle that defies easy explanation. The bizarre combination of a Lead Mask's cryptic instructions and the deaths of two curious electronic technicians continues to captivate the curiosity of those who delve into its details. Whether the victims were engaged in a scientific experiment, a spiritual endeavor, or encountered something beyond the realm of human understanding, the Lead Mask's case endures as a testament to the unfathomable mysteries that can emerge from the intersection of science, the unknown, and the human quest for understanding. As time marches on, the case stands as a stark reminder that some riddles may forever remain beyond the reach of definitive resolution. You have been watching The Mystery Abyss. Imagine a scenario where a colossal shark unexpectedly regurgitates a human arm. Most would assume a straightforward explanation. The shark had attacked a person, bitten off their arm, and swallowed it whole. However, reality often defies expectations. In 1935, a captive tiger shark in Australia astounded onlookers by spewing forth a human arm. Initially, it seemed like a straightforward case of a shark attack. Yet as investigators delved deeper, they discovered a far more intricate and perplexing story. Contrary to the initial assumption, the shark's teeth hadn't severed the arm. A peculiar piece of tiger shark throat debris hinted at something more sinister, a mystery that would grip the nation. The arm was identified as belonging to Jimmy Smith, a former boxer whose life took a dark turn after he hung up his gloves, immersing himself in Australia's criminal underworld. This strange incident marked the beginning of a tale that defied logic and unraveled in unexpected ways. The shark arm mystery became a puzzle that intrigued the curious minds of investigators, challenging their understanding of the human capacity for deception and violence. Little did they know, the shocking discovery was merely the tip of the iceberg, leading them into a labyrinthine world of crime, betrayal, and mystery. The shark arm murders. Off the serene shores of Coogee Beach in the idyllic spring of 1935, Bert Hobson, a seasoned fisherman, cast his line three kilometers off the coast of Sydney, Australia, hoping for a fruitful catch. Kuji Beach, renowned for its tranquil waters protected by the nearby Wedding Cake Island, was the backdrop for this unsuspecting drama. In a twist of fate, Hobson's routine fishing day took an extraordinary turn. As Hobson reeled in his line, he found himself entangled in nature's brutal ballet. A smaller shark he had hooked was snatched up by the jaws of a larger tiger shark, a majestic creature stretching four meters in length. This predatory spectacle unfolded before Hobson's eyes, underscoring the ruthless hierarchy of the sea. Deciding to seize the moment, Hobson opted not to release the formidable tiger shark. Instead, he embarked on an unusual journey, transporting the living giant to the Kuji Aquarium and swimming baths, a local establishment managed by his brother Charles. The arrival of this awe-inspiring specimen ignited a spark in the eyes of the aquarium's curator, setting the stage for a remarkable chapter in the coastal town's history. Chapter 1. We're going to need a bigger tank. Sharks had suddenly become the talk of the town, 
and not for reasons that put anyone at ease. The genesis of modern shark hysteria can be traced back to the 1970s, with the iconic film Jaws casting a long shadow. However, the fear of these marine predators had gripped the public's imagination long before Spielberg's blockbuster hit the screens. Back in 1916, a wave of terror swept the New Jersey shore, marked by four shark attacks in just a fortnight. This chilling series of events not only horrified coastal communities, but also served as the inspiration for Peter Benchley's novel Jaws, which in turn led to the iconic movie we all know today. Fast forward two decades, and Australia found itself ensnared in a rising tide of shark paranoia. In the months leading up to the capture of the tiger shark off Coogee Beach, three tragic incidents occurred in nearby waters, leaving the public on edge. The media was ablaze with shark-related news, a phenomenon that Bert Hobson, the astute proprietor of the local aquarium, recognized as an opportunity. Capitalizing on the prevailing fascination with these mysterious creatures, Hobson's instincts proved correct. The acquisition of the tiger shark became a spectacle, drawing crowds to the aquarium for a first-hand encounter with the fearsome predator. In the week following the acquisition of the tiger shark, droves of curious visitors inundated the aquarium, eager for a glimpse of the awe-inspiring creature. Yet the bustling atmosphere took a chilling turn on Anzac Day, a revered national holiday in Australia akin to Veterans Day in the United States. On this bustling day for Hobson's business, an inexplicable event unfolded casting a grim shadow over the aquarium. Around 4.30 in the afternoon, the tiger shark's behavior took a bizarre turn. Its demeanor shifted, and suddenly the creature began to vomit. Initially disgorging a rat and a bird, the spectacle took a horrifying twist. From the depths of the shark's stomach emerged something infinitely more shocking and perplexing. A human arm, a ghastly discovery that sent shockwaves through the crowd, leaving onlookers speechless. Chapter 2, The True Predator. The investigation kicked off with a sense of urgency but it didn't take long for the case to veer sharply into the realm of the inexplicable. When the police arrived at the aquarium, their grim task was to retrieve the severed arm from the tiger shark's tank. It was a daunting assignment, but they approached it with professional composure. The arm, once recovered, underwent meticulous examination by the medical examiner. What they discovered sent shockwaves through the investigators. The shark's teeth, formidable as they were, could not have been the instrument responsible for severing the arm. Instead, it was evident that the limb had been expertly separated from a body, most likely by a sharp implement like a knife. The grim truth emerged. The victim had met a brutal end at the hands of a murderer, not a shark. Despite spending 8 to 18 days within the acidic confines of the shark's stomach, the arm still bore a distinguishable tattoo. A pair of boxers in a ring was etched into the skin, a poignant detail that would later become a crucial lead in the investigation. Meanwhile, in another part of the city, the news of the arm's discovery caught the attention of Edwin Smith. As he read the unsettling account in the newspaper, a chilling realization dawned upon him. Alarmed, he contacted the police, convinced that the arm they had recovered might belong to his brother, Jimmy Smith. Chapter 3, The Chronicle of Jimmy Smith. In the vibrant tapestry of 1930s Sydney, Jimmy Smith, though born in England, found his home in the bustling suburb of Gladeville. A former lightweight boxer, Smith had transitioned into a new chapter of his life, managing a billiards hall in the heart of the city. Despite his change in career, he remained deeply rooted in a world that teetered on the edge of legality. While some described Smith as a man with no foes, the truth was far more complex. He had traversed the shady realms of Sydney's underbelly, often rubbing shoulders with individuals of questionable repute. His entanglement with the notorious Reginald Holmes, a key figure in Australian crime, marked a significant chapter in his life. Initially working as a builder for Holmes, Smith gradually delved into a realm rife with illegal activities. The duo's ventures frequently involved boats, a natural choice given Holmes' expertise as a boat builder. Together, they navigated the illicit waters embroiled in a world of drug trafficking. Smith and another associate, both in Holmes' employ, utilized a speedboat to retrieve cocaine dropped from passing ships. Their clandestine cargo was then ferried ashore, finding its way into the city's underbelly. But that wasn't the extent of Smith's criminal escapades. He also played a pivotal role in an insurance scam involving a sunken vessel, the Pathfinder. This nefarious scheme, designed to exploit insurance claims, showcased Smith's audacity and cunning. As fate would have it, another character, Patrick Brady, entered the scene. Despite a past conviction for forgery, Brady became an integral part of their trio, using his expertise to orchestrate a series of scams alongside Holmes and Smith. In the intricate dance of crime and deception, Jimmy Smith's life became a tale of ambition, risk, and the dark allure of the 1930s underworld. A story etched into the very fabric of Sydney's history. Chapter 4, Shadows of Betrayal. 
In the intricate tapestry of crime, the partnership between Smith and Holmes began to fray, its threads unraveling due to a suspected botched scam, as later speculated by investigators. The final sighting of Jimmy Smith occurred on a fateful evening April 7th, when he was seen indulging in drinks with his literal partner in crime, Patrick Brady. Witnesses observed them engaged in a game of dominoes at a hotel just outside Sydney, their laughter and camaraderie masking the sinister undercurrents at play. As the night wore on, Smith and Brady abruptly departed the hotel, their destination shrouded in mystery. Little did anyone know that this would be the last time Smith would be seen alive. When news of Smith's disappearance surfaced and suspicions of foul play arose, the eyewitness accounts from that evening turned a spotlight on Brady. It was revealed that on the same night, Brady had rented a nearby cottage, a location that would become the epicenter of the unfolding tragedy. The unfortunate turn of events pointed a damning finger at Brady. A vigilant taxi driver recalled ferrying him to Reginald Holmes' residence shortly after the investigators believed the murder transpired, cementing Brady's connection to the crime scene. The pieces of the puzzle fell into place, creating a compelling narrative that led authorities to scrutinize both Brady and Holmes. Amidst the mounting pressure, neither Brady nor Holmes proved cooperative. Their reluctance to divulge information only deepened the suspicions surrounding them. Eventually, Holmes managed to secure his release by feigning ignorance about Brady who found himself ensnared in the clutches of justice, charged with the murder of Jimmy Smith. The saga continued, a dark tale of betrayal and secrets, leaving a trail of unanswered questions in its wake. Chapter 5. A Fateful Morning on Sydney Harbor In the wake of intense police scrutiny surrounding Jimmy Smith's death, Reginald Holmes found himself grappling with a turbulent sea of emotions. A few days after the inquiries began, Holmes embarked on an early morning voyage, setting sail on one of his boats across the tranquil waters of Sydney Harbor. Accompanying him were a bottle of brandy and a small handgun. As the hours passed, the intoxicating embrace of the brandy seemed to envelop Holmes, and in a moment of despair, he decided to end his life. An eerie twist of fate unfolded as the bullet meant for his own demise struck him in the forehead, but failed to deliver the final blow. Instead, the force of the gunshot propelled him overboard, plunging him into the frigid waters. Miraculously, he regained consciousness, clambered back onto his boat, and initiated a reckless high-speed journey toward the bustling expanse of Sydney Harbor. The erratic spectacle did not escape the notice of vigilant police officers patrolling the waters. Holmes's wild trajectory raised alarms, leading to his eventual arrest on the busy Sydney Harbor. Authorities sought answers, yearning to comprehend the motives behind Holmes's attempt on his own life. Holmes provided a narrative that sent shivers down the spines of those who heard it. He recounted a harrowing encounter with Brady, who had allegedly brandished the severed arm of Jimmy Smith, using it as a menacing bargaining chip. Brady's threat was clear. Give him money or he would implicate him in Smith's murder. Holmes vehemently asserted that he played no role in the murder. Instead, he claimed that Brady alone had committed the gruesome act, dismembered Smith's lifeless body, and consigned the dismembered parts to the unforgiving ocean, an ominous tradition known among criminals as a Sydney send-off. Holmes went on to explain that while he had no involvement in the murder, he was the one who had disposed of the severed arm in the waters. Police, eager to uncover the truth, asked Holmes to stand as a witness at an impending inquest regarding the murder. He consented to cooperate, casting a faint glimmer of hope on the dark horizon. Yet on the morning designated for the inquest, a grim discovery awaited. Reginald Holmes was found lifeless in his car, his existence extinguished by three gunshot wounds. The tragedy marked the enigmatic conclusion of a man who had been entangled in a web of crime, leaving behind unanswered questions and shadows of doubt. Two prevailing theories about what happened to Reginald were floated by investigators, each weaving its own intricate tale of deception and darkness. The first almost surreal theory proposed an extraordinary narrative. Reginald Holmes had purportedly orchestrated his own demise by hiring a hitman, a notion that baffled minds given his prior survival of a suicide attempt. The second theory, while unproven, resonated with a semblance of credibility. It whispered of Patrick Brady, ensconced within prison walls, leveraging his criminal connections to orchestrate Holmes's murder. This calculated move ensured Holmes silence forever. The courtroom buzzed with speculation, the air thick with unanswered questions. With their key witness dead, no sign of the rest of Smith's body, and no actual hard evidence to try Brady for the murder. Despite being convinced he was guilty, the police were forced to acquit and release him. Nobody was ever charged with the murder. Amidst these convoluted narratives, yet another revelation emerged, casting a murky shadow over the entire affair. Rumors surfaced suggesting that Jimmy Smith might have been a fizzer or fizzgig, colloquial terms denoting a police informant. This revelation, like a spectral ghost, haunted the proceedings, adding another layer of complexity to an already baffling case. 
Strikingly, no one was ever charged with Smith's murder, leaving the truth buried in the sands of time. In a desperate bid for more evidence, the captive shark, once an unwitting player in this macabre drama, was dissected, yet it yielded no additional clues, leaving investigators at an impasse. As the years passed and the case grew colder, Brady, until his death in 1965, vehemently maintained his innocence, a steadfast stance amid the eerie echoes of a crime that continued to elude comprehension. The shark arm murders remain an unsolved mystery, a chilling enigma that transcends time. Theories abound, implicating gangsters and criminals in a web of violence and betrayal. Was Smith's fate sealed due to his role as a police informant? Did Brady act alone, or was he a pawn in a more sinister game orchestrated by larger criminals? The story of the shark arm murders continues to captivate the imagination of true crime enthusiasts and investigators alike. With each passing year, the mystery deepens, leaving us to ponder the secrets that lie beneath the surface of this haunting tale. A tale that will forever be etched into the dark corners of Sydney's grisly past. You have been watching The Mystery Abyss. In March 1998, aboard the Rhapsody of the Seas en route to Curaçao, Amy Lynn Bradley vanished without a trace. At approximately 5.30 a.m. on March 24, 1998, Ron Bradley glanced out at the balcony of his cabin on a Royal Caribbean cruise ship and saw his daughter, Amy Lynn Bradley, peacefully lounging. Thirty minutes later, he looked again, only to find her gone, disappearing without a trace. The most straightforward explanation for Amy Lynn Bradley's disappearance would be that she fell overboard and was lost to the unforgiving depths of the ocean. However, Amy was an accomplished athlete, a strong swimmer and a trained lifeguard, and the ship was not far from the safety of the shore. Amy Lynn Bradley's vanishing act has baffled investigators for decades, leaving behind an unsettling mystery. And more disturbingly, her disappearance appears to be far more sinister than a mere case of someone lost at sea. Since that fateful day, there have been a series of disturbing sightings of her. And in 2005, seven years after she vanished, her family was confronted with a chilling photograph that hinted at her fate. Vanished on a cruise ship, the haunting story of Amy Lynn Bradley. Amy Lynn Bradley, born on May 12, 1974, embarked on a Caribbean cruise vacation in March 1998 that would ultimately lead to her mysterious disappearance, a baffling incident that continues to haunt her family and investigators to this day. At the age of 23, Amy had recently graduated from Longwood University, where she had excelled in both basketball and swimming. Her promising future included a job offer at a computer consulting firm upon graduation, reflecting her talent and determination. In March 1998, as a celebratory event, Amy decided to join her family on a cruise aboard the Royal Caribbean International cruise ship, Rhapsody of the Seas, bound for the Caribbean island of Curaçao. Ron and Iva Bradley, Accompanied by their adult children, Amy and Brad boarded the Rhapsody of the Seas on March 21, 1998 in Puerto Rico. Their journey was intended to take them from Puerto Rico to Aruba and then to Curaçao in the Netherlands Antilles. The cruise was meant to be a joyous occasion, a chance for the Bradleys to relax and enjoy their time together. But what was supposed to be a memorable and relaxing break would soon transform into a chilling nightmare. Chapter 1 vanished without a trace. On the night of March 23rd, the ship was anchored just off the coast of Curaçao. Initially, it seemed like any other typical night on a cruise ship. Amy and her younger brother Brad indulged in the ship's nightlife, attending a late-night dance party at the Mardi Gras nightclub, dancing to the tunes of a band named Blue Orchid. During the festivities, Amy was seen dancing and socializing with one of the band members, Alistair Douglas also known as Yellow. This interaction was captured on videotape by a videographer named Chris Fenwick, adding a chilling layer of detail to the events of that fateful night. Around 3.30 a.m. on March 24th, Brad decided to retire for the night and return to their family cabin. Amy followed him about five minutes later. The siblings spent some time chatting on the suite's balcony before eventually going to sleep. Little did Brad know that it would be the last time he ever saw his sister. The last words I said to Amy were, I love you before I went to sleep that night. Brad later recalled. Knowing that's the last thing I said to her has always been very comforting to me. Several hours later, their father Ron spotted his daughter on the deck of their family's stateroom. Initially, everything seemed normal, but when he woke up between 5.15 and 5.30 and looked again, Amy had vanished along with her cigarettes and lighter. Ron searched the ship's common areas, but couldn't find her. Alarmed, he alerted the rest of the family at 6.30, setting off a frantic search operation within the confines of the cruise ship. 
Desperate, they pleaded with the cruise ship staff to halt the planned docking at Curaçao. Their pleas fell on deaf ears, and the crew's response was marred by delay. They held off making a ship-wide announcement for nearly two hours, a crucial delay that hampered search efforts and deepened the family's distress, amplifying the already dire situation. During those two hours, the gangplank was lowered, allowing both passengers and staff to disembark. If Amy Lynn Bradley had left of her own accord, this opportunity allowed her to slip away unnoticed. However, her family vehemently rejected the idea that she had run away. Amy Lynn Bradley had a new job and a recently acquired apartment in Virginia, not to mention her cherished pet bulldog Daisy. What was even more troubling was that docking the ship in Curaçao provided potential kidnappers with an ideal chance to abduct Amy Lynn Bradley from the vessel and blend seamlessly into the bustling crowd, intensifying the family's fears. Chapter 2. The Search Amidst their desperate search for their missing daughter, the Bradley family found little assistance from the cruise ship staff. The crew adamantly refused to announce Amy's disappearance or display her photos around the vessel until the ship reached port, fearing it might unsettle other passengers. Despite the urgency, the ship's crew limited their search efforts to common areas, neglecting to inspect staff or passenger cabins, leaving a significant gap in their investigative measures. The Netherlands Antilles Coast Guard conducted an intensive four-day search that ended on March 27th, yielding no sign of Amy. Determined to find their missing daughter, Royal Caribbean Cruise Lines chartered a boat to continue the search utilizing helicopters and a radar plane. Despite these extensive efforts, Amy's whereabouts remained an enigmatic puzzle, leaving her family desperate for answers. Initial theories surrounding Amy's disappearance included the possibility of her falling overboard or committing suicide. However, these speculations were quickly dismissed due to Amy's proficiency in swimming and the absence of any evidence indicating foul play or suicide. The focus of the investigation shifted toward the cruise ship staff. The Bradley family observed that certain individuals on board had been paying special attention to their daughter. We noticed immediately there was a tremendous amount of attention toward Amy from the crew members, remarked Iva Bradley, highlighting the family's growing suspicion of the staff's involvement in the baffling disappearance of their daughter. At a particular moment, Ron Bradley recalled a waiter inquiring about Amy's name, stating that they wanted to take her to Carlos and Charlie's restaurant during the ship's stop in Aruba. When Ron questioned his daughter about it, Amy responded firmly, I wouldn't go and do anything with any of those crew members. They give me the creeps. This chilling incident takes on an even more disturbing tone considering that Carlos and Charlie's restaurant is the same place where Natalie Holloway, an 18-year-old American woman who disappeared in Aruba in 2005, was last seen. Furthermore, the Bradley family received accounts from witnesses who claimed to have seen Amy in the early morning hours of her disappearance, accompanied by Alistair Douglas, also known as Yellow near the ship's dance club around 6 a.m. Yellow vehemently denied these allegations, adding a layer of intrigue to the unfolding mystery. In the months following Amy Lynn Bradley's disappearance, her family took desperate measures to find her. They reached out to congressmen, foreign officials, and even the White House seeking assistance. Frustrated by the lack of helpful responses, they decided to hire private detectives, launched a dedicated website, and established a 24-hour hotline in the relentless pursuit of answers. Yet despite their relentless efforts, their search yielded no results. My gut feeling to this day, expressed Iva Bradley, was somebody saw her, somebody wanted her, and somebody took her. Chapter 3. Puzzling Sightings The concerns of the Bradley family regarding Amy Lynn Bradley's mysterious vanishing were not baseless. While the initial investigation yielded no leads, numerous individuals in the Caribbean have come forward claiming to have encountered their missing daughter over the years. In August 1998, a staggering five months after her disappearance, two Canadian tourists reported sighting a woman who perfectly matched Amy's description on a beach. Astonishingly, the woman even bore the same tattoos as Amy, a Tasmanian devil with a basketball on her shoulder, a sun on her lower back, a Chinese symbol on her right ankle, and a lizard on her navel. These eerie sightings only served to deepen the mystery surrounding Amy's inexplicable disappearance. In a startling revelation, tourist David Carmichael emphatically stated that he was 100% certain the woman he saw was Amy Lynn Bradley. Then in 1999, a Navy petty officer claimed to have encountered a woman identifying herself as Amy Bradley in a Curacao brothel. She pleaded for his assistance, stating that she was being held against her will, but he refrained from reporting the incident to avoid trouble. The officer kept this information to himself until he recognized Amy Lynn Bradley's face on the cover of People magazine. In the autumn of 1999, Amy's parents received an email from a man claiming to be a Navy SEAL soldier named Frank Jones. 
He presented himself as a former U.S. Army Special Officer leading a team of skilled soldiers, suggesting they could potentially rescue Amy. Jones described seeing Amy held captive by heavily armed Colombian personnel within a barbed wire surrounded housing complex. To prove the authenticity of his claims, he accurately described Amy's tattoos and sang the lullaby her mother used to sing for her. Over the following months, Jones provided updates on supposed sightings of Amy and assured the family of ongoing rescue efforts. However, he insisted that additional funds were necessary to proceed. The Bradleys, hopeful for their daughter's return, sent Jones a total of $210,000 to support the rescue mission. Despite their financial contribution, the promised results never materialized. Jones, as it turned out, had fabricated the entire story and attempted to scam the Bradleys. In February 2002, federal prosecutors charged him with defrauding the Bradleys and the National Missing Children's Organization out of over $200,000. Jones pleaded guilty to mail fraud in April and was subsequently sentenced to five years in prison. This cruel deception by this disturbing scammer added to the family's anguish, leaving them emotionally devastated. Reflecting on the incident, Ron Bradley stated, If there's a chance, I mean, what else do you do? If it was your child, what would you do? So I guess we took a chance, and I guess we lost. The alleged sightings persisted. Six years later, a woman came forward claiming she had encountered Bradley in a department store restroom in Barbados. According to the witness, the woman introduced herself as Amy from Virginia and was engaged in a heated altercation with two or three men. Then in 2005, the Bradleys received an email containing a photograph depicting a woman who bore a striking resemblance to Amy, lying on a bed in her underwear. A member of an organization dedicated to locating sex trafficking victims on adult websites spotted the photo and suspected it could be Amy reigniting the family's hope amid the ongoing mystery. The woman in the photographs appeared distraught and despondent and was identified as a sex worker named Jazz. Regrettably, this distressing lead failed to yield any fresh clues. In another incident, a jawbone washed ashore in Aruba in 2010, initially believed to be connected to the missing person's case of Natalie Holloway. However, subsequent investigations cleared the jawbone of any connection to Holloway. Despite this, authorities halted further testing, even though there were reports of nine other missing Caribbean vacationers. Strangely, no DNA testing was conducted on the material, leaving the identity of the bone's origin uncertain. It was determined to be human and likely of Caucasian origin. Chapter 4, Into the Abyss As of right now, the inquiry into Amy Lynn Bradley's vanishing continues. Both the FBI and the Bradley family have extended substantial rewards in hopes of obtaining information regarding her location. Nevertheless, her disappearance endures as a troubling enigma. Numerous theories have emerged in an attempt to unravel the mystery surrounding Amy's disappearance. One chilling theory suggests she was kidnapped and sold into the illegal human trafficking industry in the Caribbean, a possibility supported by accounts such as the U.S. Navy officer's claim of hearing a woman at a brothel identifying herself as Amy and the discovery of the 2005 photo resembling her. Suspicions also linger around the ship's staff and band members on the night of her disappearance, deepening the mystery further. One suspicion revolves around the inconsistent narrative provided by the band member known as Yellow when compared to the footage captured by CCTV that night. There is also the possibility of involvement by the waiter mentioned by Amy's father. Throughout the night, the same waiter approached Amy's family repeatedly asking them to pass on a note to Amy, inviting her for a drink once they reached shore. Additionally, the cruise ship's professional photographer had printed out photos taken during the cruise to sell at a stall, but the family couldn't locate any pictures of Amy leading them to believe that someone might have removed them. Another grim theory proposes that Amy was murdered on the ship and thrown overboard. This theory gained traction with the discovery of the jawbone washed ashore in Aruba in 2010. But this unidentified jawbone has, as of right now, no direct link to the case. Despite the passage of time and the absence of concrete answers, Amy Lynn Bradley's family continues to seek closure. In 2010, 12 years after her disappearance, Amy was finally declared legally dead, a heartbreaking acknowledgement of the family's enduring pain and uncertainty. To aid in the search for their daughter, the FBI currently offers a reward of up to $25,000 for information leading to her recovery or the arrest of those responsible. In addition to the FBI reward, her family also offers substantial rewards for her safe return and any information about her current location, underscoring their relentless determination to find Amy and bring her home, no matter how long it takes. Thanks so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video and would like to see me cover more missing persons cases, please let me know down in the comment section below. Don't forget to like and subscribe as it really does help the channel to keep growing and it helps me to know that you're enjoying the content I'm putting out. You have been watching The Mystery of This.
July 26, 1974 began like any other ordinary day in the quaint town of Provincetown, Massachusetts. But the town's peaceful tranquility was completely shattered when a young girl stumbled upon the lifeless body of a woman, unclothed and abandoned amidst the dunes at Race Point. When her body was discovered, it had already undergone significant decomposition, making it challenging to pinpoint her time of death. Estimated to be between 10 days and three weeks prior, speculations arose, suggesting the possibility that the woman might have been preserved elsewhere before being strategically placed at the scene. Compounding the mystery, her hands were severed and never recovered, while the killer attempted to extract most of her teeth, albeit leaving behind the dental work. Lacking a name, the mysterious woman earned the moniker The Lady of the Dunes due to the location of her discovery. The unsettling puzzle of her murder haunted investigators with unanswered questions for decades. That is, until recently when the case was finally solved through investigative genealogy. After being identified in 2022, five decades after she was first found, police were finally able to uncover the mystery of what happened to her and who was responsible for her appalling murder by the end of 2023. So let's go on a journey through the history of this case together, leading up to its surprising resolution in the present day. The truth behind the Lady of the Dunes case. On July 26, 1974, a 12-year-old girl, led by the persistent barking of a dog, stumbled upon the decaying body of an unidentified woman in the Race Point Dunes of Provincetown, Nestled at the tip of the Massachusetts Peninsula, Provincetown is a renowned tourist haven, marking the terminus of the highway in Cape Cod. Celebrated for its vibrant LGBTQ community, the town attracts a multitude of visitors annually, distinguishing itself from other towns in Cape Cod. The remains lay just a few yards from a road, surrounded by a noticeable influx of insects. Two sets of footprints traced a path to the body, while tire tracks were discovered 50 yards away from the scene. It was soon determined that the woman likely succumbed to death approximately two weeks before her discovery. Found face down on half of a beach blanket, the victim showed no signs of struggle, leading authorities to speculate that she either knew her assailant or was asleep when the incident occurred. Positioned beneath her head were a blue bandana and a pair of Wrangler jeans. Her auburn hair secured in a ponytail by a gold-flecked elastic band cascaded down. Pink-painted toenails added a touch of color. She exhibited expensive dental work, including crowns valued between five and $10,000, which remained despite her assailant having removed all of her natural teeth. Notably, both hands and one forearm were absent. Police determined the woman to be around five feet six inches tall, with a weight of 145 pounds and an athletic build, and estimated her to be between 25 and 40 years old. One side of the woman's head had been crushed, pointing towards the conclusion that she succumbed to blunt force trauma. Surprisingly, no weapon was recovered, yet the nature of her injuries hinted at a military entrenching tool as a potential instrument. Her head bore the grisly aftermath of nearly being decapitated, suggesting potential strangulation, coupled with indications of post-mortem sexual assault. The absence of teeth, hands, and a forearm led some investigators to believe that the perpetrator aimed to conceal either the victim's identity or their own. Despite exhaustive searches in the vicinity, no clues emerged regarding her identity or the circumstances leading to her presence in that location. The investigation unfolds. In the quest for answers, the investigators face the challenges of a bygone era in 1974, devoid of the technological advancements available today, making it difficult for them to identify the victim, let alone their killer. Town interviews yielded no information, as no one recalled seeing or claimed to know the woman. Her descriptions failed to align with any missing person reports and the absence of hands rendered her fingerprints unobtainable. The police extended their inquiries to motorcyclists and ATV riders in the vicinity. Despite identifying the owners of abandoned bicycles, their efforts yielded no substantial leads to establish her identity. Despite the police's diligent efforts to trace the dentist responsible for the estimated $5,000 worth of dental work, their attempts were in vain. In 1974, such a sum represented a substantial amount of money, but no dentist stepped forward to acknowledge performing the work. By 1979, a facial reconstruction of the woman was fashioned from clay, but again it failed to result in any new leads. Her remains underwent examination in 1980, during which no new clues emerged, although the skull was not interred at that time. Other exhumations similarly failed to find anything helpful in resolving the case. In May 2010, a CT scan of her skull generated images utilized by the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children for a subsequent reconstruction, finally giving us a potential image of the Lady of the Dunes. Initial Theories 
Over the last 50 years, various theories about who the Lady of the Dunes was and what happened to her have emerged, with some presenting plausible explanations. Whitey Bulger, a name that resonates prominently among Massachusetts residents, held an infamous reign over parts of Boston that has yet to be rivaled since his death, leading many to question if he could be entwined with this unusual case. Examining the specifics of the case reveals a distinct effort by the killer to shroud the victim's identity, a characteristic synonymous with Bulger. Infamous for a significant body count, some of Bulger's victims remain unidentified to this day. In the 1970s, Bulger frequented the Crown and Anchor, a popular Provincetown bar. It's documented that he was present in Provincetown around the time of the murder and the subsequent discovery of the body. A witness only coming forward after Bulger's arrest in California claims to have seen Bulger with a woman resembling the composite of the victim. Unfortunately, the witness lacks knowledge of her name and police were unable to corroborate the information. After Bulger passed away, any potential connection remained elusive. Yet, an unmistakable resemblance persisted between this murder and others attributed to Bulger, leaving the possibility of a link lingering in the shadows for many investigators. Haddon Clark, a prisoner diagnosed with schizophrenia, confessed to the murder of the Lady of the Dunes, but the veracity of his account remained unconfirmed. It was concluded that he could not have committed the crime, attributing his confession to his mental illness. There is no apparent connection between Clark and Provincetown during the time of the murder or the discovery of the body, leading to his official exclusion as a suspect. Initial speculation suggested the unidentified woman might be Rory Kessinger, an escapee from the Plymouth County Correctional Facility in 1973. But subsequent DNA analysis disproved this theory. While current information remains elusive about her, it is likely that she disappeared following her jailbreak. Two other missing women, Francis Ewalt of Montana and Vicki Lamberton of Massachusetts, were also ruled out. In 1987, a Canadian woman informed authorities that she had witnessed her father strangling a woman during a vacation in Provincetown. Unfortunately, by the time Provincetown police were contacted, the woman had relocated without leaving a forwarding address, and her whereabouts remain unknown. Another call, this time from a woman in Maryland, asserted that the composite photo resembled her missing sister, who supposedly moved to Boston, but efforts to trace the caller reached a dead end when her location could not be determined. In 2015, Joe Hill, the son of renowned novelist Stephen King, observed a woman in the crowd around the 54-minute mark of the movie Jaws, who strikingly resembled the lady in the dunes. Was she possibly an extra or merely caught in the crowd as enthusiasts flocked to Martha's Vineyard to catch a glimpse of famous actors? Confirming her status as an extra proved challenging given the less extensive records maintained for movie extras in 1974 compared to today. Notably, the movie was filmed in July of 1974, heightening the possibility that the woman in question could be the victim, though it remains unverifiable. For the last five decades, these theories and speculations were all that investigators had to go off of, but it wouldn't be long before everything would change. DNA answers after 50 years. In 2022, the skeletal remains of the Lady of the Dunes underwent analysis at Othram Forensics Lab, resulting in the generation of a DNA profile. This profile was utilized to identify distant relatives, ultimately leading to the identification of the victim. On October 31, 2022, the FBI field office in Boston officially declared that the victim had been identified as Ruth Marie Terry. The announcement did not divulge any details regarding potential suspects, and the circumstances surrounding Terry's presence in Massachusetts at the time of her murder remained undisclosed. The FBI clarified that Terry's identity was established through investigative genealogy, employing the same method used to identify numerous unidentified homicides in over 150 criminals, including the Golden State Killer. Born on September 8, 1936, in a makeshift mountainside dwelling in Whitwell, Tennessee, Ruth Marie Terry entered the world to Johnny and Eva Terry. Following a brief marriage in 1957, Ruth departed Whitwell to seek employment at the Fisher Body Automotive Plant in Livonia, Michigan. In 1958, she gave birth to her son Richard, but financial hardships prevented her from caring for him. In a unique arrangement, the superintendent of her workplace, Richard Hanchett Sr., adopted her son in exchange for covering her expenses. With the adoption finalized, Ruth left Livonia and relocated to California. Her attempt to reconnect with her son in 1972 was thwarted as he was grappling with the aftermath of a drug overdose that left him in a coma for 18 days. On February 16, 1974, Ruth entered into marriage with Guy Rockwell Muldaven, an antiques dealer based in Reno, Nevada. Four months before her demise, the couple visited Terry's family in Whitwell, 
According to Ruth's grandniece, Ruth exhibited noticeable changes in behavior when with Moldavan, who displayed possessive tendencies. Following their visit, the couple journeyed to Chattanooga to see Ruth's half-brother, Kenneth, and his wife, Carol. During this visit, Ruth and Moldavan mentioned plans to travel the U.S. in search of antiques, expressing interest in visiting Massachusetts as they departed. In the late summer of 1974, Moldavan returned to Tennessee to inform Ruth's family that she had disappeared from their California residence. Jan Terry, Ruth's sister-in-law, recalled his brief stay and vague statements about not knowing Ruth's whereabouts. In response, Ruth's brother, James, traveled to California and engaged a private investigator to locate her. The investigator conveyed to the family that all of Ruth's belongings had been sold, suggesting her voluntary departure after involvement with a religious cult. In family obituaries over the subsequent two decades, Ruth was listed as deceased. Carol speculated that Ruth might be in a witness protection program, rendering her unable to contact her family. The truth unraveled. Now that investigators knew the identity of the victim, it didn't take long to identify her killer after looking at those closest to her, namely, her husband. Cape and Islands District Attorney Robert Galibois disclosed that Ruth's husband, Guy Rockwell Moldovan, who had married her just a few months before her disappearance, was now known to be her assailant. Moldavan had also been a prime suspect in the deaths of another one of his wives and a stepdaughter in the 1960s. While the specifics leading to the breakthrough in the investigation have not been disclosed, Dia Galibois confirmed the closure of one of the state's most infamous cold cases. Based on the investigation into the death of Miss Terry, it has been determined that Mr. Moldavan was responsible for Ms. Terry's death in 1974. Mr. Moldavan passed away in 2002, declared the statement issued. Following Ruth's identification, investigators quickly honed in on Moldavan. State police disclosed that they discovered he had been using his wife's car upon their return from a trip to Tennessee to visit her family. When Mr. Moldavan returned from that trip, he was driving what was believed to be Ms. Terry's vehicle and indicated to witnesses that Ms. Terry had passed away, stated Mr. Galibois in an official statement. Ms. Terry was never seen by her family again. So who exactly was Guy Rockwell Moldavan? A family friend, expressing astonishment over the unfolding revelations about Moldavan, noted that during their acquaintance, both he and Moldavan were residing in California, the very state where Moldavan eventually passed away. He emphasized that they were nowhere near Provincetown, Massachusetts, or Reno, Nevada, or any other locations that are referred to in connection with Moldavan today. Reflecting on the Moldavan he knew, the friend remarked, He was great. I really loved him. I mean, he was terrific, and I was very close to him. I'm speechless because none of it makes any sense. He mentioned, however, that his knowledge of Moldavan's background was limited, except for the belief that he was born in New Mexico. Born in 1923, according to police records, Moldavan's early life remains shrouded in mystery, with aliases such as Raul Guy Rockwell and Guy Moldavan Rockwell adding complexity. In 1942, Moldavan resided in New York City and pursued studies at the American Academy of Dramatic Arts. His military service during World War II was curtailed due to a mastoid infection. On May 11, 1946, he married Joellen May Loop in Bellevue, Pennsylvania, while working as a professor. Their journey took them from New York to California, and ultimately Seattle, Washington, where Moldavan assumed the role of a disc jockey. The couple's marriage concluded on July 16, 1956. Two years later, on September 30, 1958, Moldavan entered matrimony with Manzanita Aileen Ryan in Idaho. The mysterious disappearances of Manzanita and her 18-year-old daughter Dolores Ann Mearns on April Fool's Day of 1960 in Seattle thrust Moldavan into the spotlight as the primary suspect. Fleeing Seattle, he was apprehended by the FBI and charged with unlawful flight to evade testimony in the investigation of their deaths. In July, Moldovan divorced Manzanita, citing desertion, and promptly married Evelyn Emerson. However, Moldavan then faced larceny charges for defrauding his third wife's family of $10,000. Convicted in 1961, he received a 15-year prison sentence, suspended under the condition of repaying the money by March 1962. Renowned true crime writer Anne Rule delved into Moldavan's connection with the Ryan Mearns disappearances in her 2007 book Smoke, Mirrors, and Murder. Rule highlighted investigators' discovery of dismembered human body parts in Moldovan's septic tank, although no concrete link to the missing women could be established without a body. Rule noted Moldavan's marriage to a woman named Terry in February 1974 in Reno, Nevada. As it would turn out, this would be the Lady of the Dunes, Ruth Marie Terry who had vanished just months after marrying him. 
Moldavan also emerged as the prime suspect in the murder of Henry Lawrence Baird, a 28-year-old bread truck driver, and the disappearance of Barbara Jo Kelly, a 17-year-old waitress, in June 1950. Barbara vanished after a date with Baird, whose body was discovered the next day with a gunshot to the back of the head. With so many missing people and dead bodies linked to Moldavan, it appears he may have been an unidentified serial killer during his lifetime, with potentially half a dozen known bodies associated with him, and anyone's guess as to how many more he may have been responsible for. With this tragic truth uncovered, the case of the Lady of the Dunes, one of America's most notorious cold cases, has finally been laid to rest. I don't know about you, but this case being solved after five decades gives me hope that other notorious cold cases we've covered such as the Isdal Woman, Room 1046, or the Keddie Cabin Murders may also one day be solved. And with that, our exploration of this now solved cold case comes to an end. As always, thanks so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe and drop a comment down below with your thoughts. You have been watching The Mystery Abyss.